Well, to begin with, uh, <clears throat> I want to thank the people of South Carolina for the uh, honor of representing in the United States Senate yet again. This will be my third term. Um, I appreciate the job, I think, now more than ever. The more you get to know the people of South Carolina, the more honored you are to be their representative. Uh, last night, <clears throat> there's a lot to be learned, and my <clears throat> number one observation about last night from a Republican point of view is I think we did well uh, because of President Obama's failures, not so much embracing who we are, but candidates do matter. The Republican Party of 2014 in terms of central candidates was the best I've seen. We probably lost four seats in the last four years by running people who just could not uh, get in the end zone. Great job of recruiting candidates, and the right kind of conservative can win in a blue state. Each candidate on the Republican side embraced a bold foreign policy. They rejected leading from behind. So from my point of view, the Republican conference is going to be made up of more traditional national security Republicans in this uh, era of uh, flirting with isolationism, I think, is passed. Each candidate running for the Senate in all these contested races embraced a muscular foreign policy, realizing that we're under tremendous threat from radical Islam. Uh, each candidate in their victory speech promised to work with the other side to move the country forward. I thought Mitch McConnell's speech last night was the best I've ever heard Mitch. Now we have to make the words a reality. The president called last night. We had a rather lengthy discussion. I think the president is very sincere in wanting to find common ground. Only time will tell. He talked about uh, the infrastructure needs of this country. The port of Charleston is just one of many ports that need to be modernized. Our roads and bridges are falling apart. Republicans, Democrats, and Independents rely upon highways. There are opportunities. We talk a bit about immigration. <clears throat> My advice to the President for what it's worth, please do not try to enact immigration reform by executive order. If you confer legal status by executive order on millions of illegal immigrants without first securing a border, you will invite uh, further illegal immigration. It will be run on America. People will believe if you can get here illegally, you're going to get to stay legally. So executive action is a bad signal to send to the rest of the world, and it will poison the well when it comes to finding a solution within the Congress. I do believe there is a bipartisan solution uh, there to be had on immigration. We can make a strong down payment in this Congress uh, in fixing a broken immigration system. I intend to seek common ground on this issue as I've been trying for the last eight years almost. Every American is frustrated by a broken immigration system. The Hispanic community in America is right, rightfully upset uh, at inaction. So the President may have the temptation to go it alone on immigration. Please resist that temptation, Mr. President, and give us a chance to work with you to find common ground on immigration reform. Every election is a rebirth of democracy. There's a new Congress about to uh, come and be, and people are saying all the right things. Let's see if we can put actions behind the words. So with that, I'll take any questions you have. How do you think Congress will move forward? Well, the new people coming in have run uh, long, hard campaigns. I would hate to be in the Senate denying these people an opportunity to vote in big problems. I think the new voices in the Senate are going to push the body to do better. Senator Reid allowed the Senate to become dysfunctional. The question for Republicans, will we restore the traditional uh, way the Senate works, which is allowing everybody to have a say and vote. I hope so. But infrastructure uh, re 
reform uh, infrastructure spending seems to be a good place to start. I think there's a real demand out there by both parties to see if we can replenish the highway trust fund. Well, Senator Graham, you mentioned that every few years we see a rebirth of democracy. Right. Uh, with, yes, sir. Well, in 2006, we saw uh, Democrats get some gains during the Bush administration. Of right. course, now Republicans are starting to gain some of this territory back. Right. What will it take for Republicans to keep this hold in the next two years when uh, we start seeing this election is, places? Uh, there are really, you know, I hate to steal a phrase from John Edwards, but there are two Americas. There's the midterm America and there's the presidential America. We do very well in midterms as Republicans, not so well in presidential cycles. The people who show up to vote in presidential cycles, we've got a problem with. In 2004, there were 55 Republican senators with a newly elected Republican president. By 2008, we were down to 40. Cautionary tale to the Republican Party. There are a lot of the press trying to spot at Democrats today. Uh, if we don't do it right, we will be right back where we were. Uh, we will lose ground in 16 if we can't prove to the country that there's a new Republican Party that's going to come to Washington to get things done. It puts a lot of pressure on McConnell and Reid to come up with a positive agenda. And uh, there are times to fight the other side. We need to really try to replace Obamacare. That will be a fight worth having. But there's also a time to govern. And I hope that the president will do his part. Let me just say this. If the president challenged the Republican Party to come meet him in the middle and we we refuse that challenge, we would do poorly in 2016. Conversely, if he continues to stiff arm us and be a distant president who only talks on the phone and doesn't engage the Congress, Hillary Clinton and every Democrat in 2016 will pay a price. If he gives amnesty by executive order, uh, I think it really will hurt the Democratic Party because most Americans are very comfortable with a rational solution to the 11 million. After you fix your borders and you uh, reform your legal immigration system, very few Americans are going to welcome the idea of blanket amnesty by executive order without first addressing the border and fixing your legal immigration uh, system. In the exit polls last night in South Carolina, there was a question on the ballot about whether or not the 11 million should be deported have a chance to stay here uh, on our terms, not theirs. South Carolinians, very conservative state, overwhelmingly supported the idea of a legal status under the right conditions. Can you talk about um, Senate Armed Services Committee and how that'll change moving forward? I know good news that the Coast Guard choppers are staying, <coughs> RAF continues to be choppers. Of the well, uh, I'll wait for this question. Now, here's what I want to do. My number one goal is to start on November the 12th, the first day of the lame duck, asking that my legislation requiring a vote on any deal between the Obama administration and Iran regarding their nuclear program come to the Senate for review in an up or down vote. I'm gonna push that with a passion. The worst possible thing we could do in terms of our own national security is to enter into a bad deal regarding the Iranian nuclear program have an outcome like North Korea, where you start with a small program and the UN fails to keep it small. I think we're headed down a very dangerous path with Iran. I think the deal being talked about is unsound and will not work, but all I ask is it come to the Senate for a scrutiny and a vote, and if it's a good deal, I'll vote for it. Next year, Senator McCain and I have talked extensively throughout the day and last night. Our number one priority, and he'll be the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, is to take the defense cuts under sequestration and replace them with more reasonable cuts in other areas of the government. I am willing to generate revenue to buy back some sequestration by closing loopholes and eliminating deductions, not raising tax rates. In return, I hope Democrats will do some structural changes to entitlements. That's where the big money's at and we can together do a mini Simpson Bowles deal to replace sequestration that's destroying the military, hurting the NIH and the CDC. That is my number one priority for 2015.
Because this, I believe with all my heart, we're at war and we're gutting our defense infrastructure at a time we need it the most. And nationally, last night, 71% of Americans said the following. They believe that another attack on our homeland by terrorists is somewhat or very likely. Unfortunately, they're right. If we do not up our game in the defense world, in the intelligence world, we're setting ourselves up to be hit again. And these cuts to our defense infrastructure and the intelligence community are devastating and make no sense in light of the risk we're facing. Are there ways to save money uh, on defense spending or defense infrastructure without taking cuts? Uh, we have already cut the Defense Department by $489 billion before sequestration. Another $89 billion before that. Sequestration was never supposed to happen. So we're trying to find a way to save $1.2 trillion over the next decade. And if you fail uh, to find a bipartisan solution, Half of the cuts would come out of defense as a deterrent, as a reason to get to get the deal. Here's what awaits us if sequestration is not replaced. The Army will be at 1940 levels, 420,000 people in the Army, woefully insufficient to deal with the world as it is. The smallest Navy since 1915. How do you fit it to Asia? There'll be no ships, less than 300 ships. But from an apples to apples comparison, at the end of the sequestration cuts, we'll be spending 2.3% of the GDP of this nation on defense. The historical average has been over 5% since Vietnam. We will have cut our defense spending in half, and it will devastate our ability to modernize our force, build enough people and the right equipment to win the next war that may be coming our way. The F-35 and the F-22 cannot be deployed in enough numbers. That means pilots flying the F-16, <clears throat> the F-18, and the F-15 are more likely to get shot down in the next conflict. We're putting our people at risk. We're cutting our defense budget in half at a time when we need to build it up, not reduce it. I'm all for modernizing and reforming the Defense Department. Count me in in that endeavor, but what we're doing is gutting it. There's a difference between reforming DOD and gutting DOD. We're on the path to gut it, and if you don't believe me, ask all of our generals. With the election results last night, do you think it was the people of America sending a clear message? I think it was the midterm people of America sending a message. <laughs> uh, the message was, uh, we don't like the way the country's going. Overwhelming discontent with the President Obama's policies. His policies were on the ballot. Obamacare is blown up in his face. Uh, the consequences of Obamacare are becoming more real every day to the average American. People are losing work hours because of Obamacare. They're losing their coverage, their premiums, and their deductibles are going up. There's a rebellion in the ranks. Now, what is our solution? It's one thing to complain about Obamacare. It's another thing to find a solution to replace it. The challenge now for the Republican Party is to find willing Democrats to come up with an alternative. It's no longer enough for Republicans to complain. We have to provide solutions. And if we can find common sense solutions to replace Obamacare, Democrats reject us, they will suffer. If we don't try, then we will suffer. Uh, you mentioned that on in your phone call with President Obama last night, he seemed willing to compromise. What would be the biggest uh, indicator that that is it, that he's backing up that? Well, you know, everybody's talking in a fashion the public likes right now. You know, they've been battered and bruised, and we're excited and hopeful. Well, the old animosities take over. I think the new people coming to the Senate and the House need to make sure that we don't drift back into our old ways of doing business. But here's what the President said that struck me the most. Yeah, here's what he said that struck me the most. He said, there's a lot we don't agree on and we're never gonna get there. And I said, yes, you're right. But there should be enough that we can restore confidence in the American people that their government is not completely broken. And he said, let's try some small and medium-sized um, endeavors to create momentum that may lead to a bigger uh, deal. But without the small and the medium-sized uh, compromise, there will never be a big deal. And the President 
wanted to find ways to create momentum for problem solving because he believed rightly that it would help the American people restore their belief that the government is not hopelessly lost and would increase our standing overseas. And I think he's right about that. So when the president said a medium or a small size deal will restore confidence and increase our standing in the world, I think he's absolutely right. So Mr. President, here I am. I'm ready to go to work. Senator Reid called me just a few minutes ago. I gotta call him back. We'll see where this goes. Can you give some examples of small and medium sized yes, areas? The highway trust fund is being depleted as I speak. We drive further on our gallon of gas than we've ever driven. A lot of hybrid cars on the road, so the gasoline tax revenue is falling short of the needs. Barbara Boxer and Lindsey Graham, not, not two people that go into the same sentence very often, have legislation to allow the money trapped overseas earned by American health corporations that would uh, require a 35% tax rate if brought back in the United States, a 10% one-time good deal. That $2 trillion that is held by American companies overseas that they're not gonna bring back at 35% because it's already been taxed overseas. Uh, Barbara and I are trying to get a 10% rate, a one-time good deal, and dedicate the revenue to the highway trust fund. Uh, that would uh, give a good shot in the arm for what we need to do. And to try to find a way to modernize our ports, we were talking about not just Charleston. And one thing I said about the President and Vice President, they're very aware of the Port of Charleston, <laughs> and I appreciate their interest. Now, on the Keystone Pipeline, I think there's a willingness by Democrats now to embrace the pipeline. Uh, there, there are a lot of things. The immigration, uh, there, there are deals to be made there, but I would think infrastructure is the biggest win-win. Every member of the House and the Senate would love to be able to go back to their constituents and say, I I was part of a team that helped solve a problem that you experienced in your daily life. In South Carolina, our roads and bridges are falling apart. Our ports have to be modernized. So that's what I would suggest to the President. Now, tax code reform, we mentioned that. You know, lowering the corporate tax rate, I think, would increase the likelihood of economic growth and help the economy. So those are two examples. Are you, is it realistic that the gridlock will change in the next two years? Or? Here's what's realistic. If it doesn't, we're all going to get clobbered. Uh, I mean, I'm still standing after all these years because I'm willing, on occasion, to say, yes, let's see if we can get there from the biggest criticism levied against me in the primary is that I worked with Democrats. At the end of the day, it was my salvation. I have a conservative record. You just have to go look at it. It's there to be seen if you would like. But I also have a streak in me that says, you know, I can't always get everything I want. And it's good to find common ground or common good. I really do believe that what I have been doing all these years is becoming more attractive politically. I would say this to anybody who's been elected in this cycle. Six years from now, if people believe you said one thing during the campaign and you did another, you're going to lose. President Obama's biggest problem is he campaigned as a centrist and he's governed from the left ditch. Here's going to be our problem. If we take the car from the left ditch to the right ditch, we're going to be in trouble too. People want the car in the middle of the road. They want it in the right center lane of the road not in the right ditch.